But at last I became sick of those Jews. In the first place, they were forever squabbling, even in the temple area, where the priests were at loggerheads with the interpreters of the law. The clamor of their arguments reached high heaven. On one occasion they even came to blows, and we were afraid of a revolt. I had to send my Ascalonites down into the outer court to do a little pacification among the priests and the scholars. I thought heaven knew what high philosophic principle, what crucial religious problem was dividing them. But the matter at dispute was thoroughly trifling, one of the minutiae of their ritual. Would you believe it? The fight broke out over the question whether the Jew bringing his sacrifice was supposed to place his hands on the head of the sheep and confess his sins, or whether he had to confess his sins without placing his hands on the head of the sheep. I was utterly at a loss as to the significance of it all. I know only one thing. I suffered the extremest torments of boredom up there on the Antonia. One fine morning there appeared before me in the citadel a young man of excellent appearance. He wore a Roman toga in the best metropolitan fashion, and were it not for a suggestion of an Alexandrian accent, I might have taken him for an authentic Roman noble, so perfectly did he speak the language. He had a fine figure, athletic but not muscular. His manners were distinguished. He addressed me as follows. Hegemon, this was my official title among the Jews, as long as you find it necessary to stay in our modest city of Jerusalem, which, because of the severity of our religious laws, lacks the Greco-Roman versions to which you are accustomed, my father, the oldest high priest, begs that you do him the honor of considering his house with all that it contains at your disposal. He has further entrusted me with the honorable mission of offering you this laurel wreath, made of the finest gold, in token of invitation to the supper which he is arranging for you for tomorrow. My father, the oldest high priest, my brother Eliezer, former high priest, my all other brothers and myself, will exert ourselves to provide some modest compensation for your labors for the peace of our city. I must admit that the young man produced an excellent impression. I had not expected to encounter among the Jerusalemites this educated type. After brief reflection, I accepted the invitation. At the appointed hour, I was admitted into a residence, actually not one house, but a series of structures. From the outside, as in the case of all these palaces of Jerusalem, nothing was visible. The place might have been taken for a barracks. The house was constructed of blocks of Jerusalem stone, with watchmen's turrets. Within was a paradise. The first sight within the gate was the so-called external court. This was paved throughout with slabs of white marble, and about it were grouped the numerous official buildings of the high priest. Here lived the tax collectors, as well as the administration officers. There was likewise a court, in which, at the instance of the high priest, meetings were held of the inner or small Sanhedrin, which consisted largely of the members of his own family and his intimates. From the outer we passed to the inner court, which contained the gardens of the high priest, his private residence, and the residences of his relatives. In between, however, lay a smaller court or passageway, on either side of which were the rooms for his private bodyguard. When we emerged into the interior court, our nostrils were assailed by the intoxicating odor of countless unfamiliar trees and shrubs grouped in a well-laid park about several swimming pools. Tall cypresses, oleanders, and ethrog citron trees cast their shadows over the water. The rose, it appeared, was the favorite flower of the Jerusalem aristocracy, for the entire park was aflame with rose bushes of various hues. Outside, in the city, the population was parched with thirst, water was a luxury, the cisterns were almost dry in the summer heat, and when the wind came in laden with the heat and fine sand of the desert, the inhabitants of the city crowded about the troughs which brought thin trickles of water from the streamlet of Siloa. They snatched the skins from the hands of the water carriers, bringing meager loads from the wells about the city and from the pools of Solomon. Up here, however, in the court of the high priest, the water gushed freely from many fountains which, in the shape of bronze lions, were grouped about the swimming pools. A special pipe conducted the water from the source in the temple to the garden of the high priest, just as special pipes led the blood of the sacrifices which spouted into the troughs to the gardens of the high priest and of other members of the aristocracy to fertilize the soil. 
The double supply of water and blood nourished the garden so well that it blossomed with indescribable beauty. The oriental plants shone in their broad flower beds. The water not only supplied the trees, bushes and plants, but flowed also into the swimming pools. Above the surface of the pools fluttered flocks of white turtle doves. Like all other large residences in Jerusalem, the house of the high priest consisted of huge blocks of stone, with no exterior decoration, so that the effect from the outside was one of extreme severity. Triangular windows, set with deep-coloured Phoenician glass, admitted a dim light into the rooms. On the northern side, facing the temple, a flight of fifteen steps, pure white marble, led up to the hall of columns. There were three rows of columns on three sides, Corinthian throughout, their capitals supporting the huge cedar wood beams of the roof, which was covered with other fine woods and adorned with mosaics. The floor, too, was one tapestry of mosaic, its blending colours woven into various Jewish religious symbols. At the top of the flight of stairs, and above the ceiling of the Hall of Columns, towered a pyramid, which closed off the façade on this side of the house. I was received at the entrance by the chief steward of the house, accompanied by a group of slaves and servants. He conducted me through the outer court. At the entrance to the inner court, there waited for me the young man who had brought me the invitation, namely, the youngest son of the old high priest. He was dressed in a mantle of silver thread, and a laurel wreath was placed on his artificially curled locks. At the foot of the hall of columns I was received by his brothers, clad in similar mantles, with similar laurel wreaths on their heads. All of them were tall and of manly aspect. Some of them had beards combed and woven in the Chaldean style. They conducted me ceremoniously up the flight of marble steps to the Hall of Columns. Servants and slaves, in light, transparent tunics, came to conduct me further, and though it was still bright day, they carried oil lamps in my honour. We passed through the Hall of Columns into the great reception hall, and there, on thrones, there waited for me the high priest and two companions, former high priests, his father-in-law Hanan and his brother-in-law Eliezer. To tell the truth, this whole business of the reception ceremony rather startled me. These Jews, it appeared, took themselves very seriously. I knew that according to their custom a former high priest had all the privileges of a reigning high priest, and these privileges were almost regal. He had the right to wear a tiara, and honours had to be accorded him as to a king. Here, however, I saw not one king, but three, and that was a bit too much for me. The reigning high priest offered me greeting in Hebrew or Aramaic. The third son of the old high priest, Theophilus, translated it for me into Greek, and I responded in the same language. Attendants brought in a couch for me, and when I had taken my place, the high priest asked me how I was enjoying my stay in Jerusalem. He expressed the hope that, although I was deprived, by reason of the religious scruples of the Jews, of the institutions to which I was accustomed in my own country, I would find in Jerusalem enough of general interest, likewise a large enough circle of educated men, to render my sojourn pleasant. I answered that we Romans did not leave the capital of the empire and take up posts in remote provinces for pleasure or amusement, but solely to perform our duties to our emperor. The audience, Jupiter be thanked, was a brief one. The regnant high priest excused himself, saying that he was compelled to proceed to the temple where the evening sacrifices were being prepared. He left me in the hands of his family, his father-in-law and his brothers-in-law, for which I was duly grateful. The meal was served according to the oriental custom, outside in the hall of columns. The slaves carried out couches covered with linens of Zidonian dye. We took our places at the tables and looked down upon Jerusalem. The hall was open on three sides to the city, which unrolled its vistas under our eyes. Opposite us was the bridge which led from the upper city by the Sanhedrin building to the temple area, and which was crowded with men and women proceeding to and from the area. The vantage point was so high that we could also look down direct into the court of the Gentiles. What lay beyond was concealed by the high, turreted golden gate on the fourteen steps and the adjoining galleries. It was pleasant to sit in the hall of columns. From behind the coloured curtains which sheltered us from the blaze of the setting sun was wafted a delicious odour of roses which interpenetrated the fabric of the curtains and cooled the air. Servants in light, transparent tunics handed us golden salvers with rose water, and we dried our hands on Zidonian serviettes. 
There Jerusalem lay before us like an enormous overheated oven. In the lower part of the city, where the poorest inhabitants lived, the clay huts looked like heaps of stones rolling down the slope to the wall, and beyond it to the Kidron Valley, whence they began to climb the further slope toward the Mount of Olives. It was only from this point in the house of the high priest that I perceived how the city spread itself upon the hills. It might have been compared to a hare springing from hilltop to hilltop. The hills were covered with descending terraces of roofs in close contiguity, and on these were ranged water cisterns alternating with artificially planted shrubs, trees, and flowers. I had not suspected that Jerusalem was so large. It spilled over far beyond its walls and covered with its new quarter the entire area of Mount Scopus, on the side of the Antonia, and down as far as the Sheep Gate and beyond. On the other side, to the east, it climbed up to the Mount of Olives, and northward it stretched to the Vale of Hinnom, the quarter of the poor. All the roofs, between the fences, balconies, and lattices which encircled them, were occupied by human beings. The inhabitants of Jerusalem sought relief from the heat beating up from the terraces of baked clay. Here and there the eye struck on a spot of green, a little cypress wood set in the midst of a clutter of houses. There, we knew, one of the aristocrats of Jerusalem was taking his ease among the shadows of his garden. But beyond the city walls, these green interludes of cypress and olive grew wider and denser. The meal proceeded in quiet dignity. There was little conversation. The actual eating seemed to have a religious character. On the right hand of the father Eliezer, the eldest son, reclined on his couch, he was treated by the slaves, the guests, and even his younger brothers with special respect, almost equal to that which was accorded to his father. My own couch was placed to the left of the old man. Opposite us were ranged the other four sons. We lay at little tables covered with linen, and the serving of the dishes was accompanied by the soft music of harp and flute proceeding from behind a curtain. There were no women to be seen. All the guests, the servitors too, were men." I observed once more that the dishes, plates, and ewers were hammered out of raw material into their necessary shapes, and were devoid of adornment and design. It seemed that in these utensils, too, the Jews sought to imitate their god, making use only of native and primitive matter. The courses, including the baked stuffs, were prepared by a Syrian cook. After the ceremonial washing of hands, the old high priest pronounced a benediction on the bread which was placed before him on a golden platter, and the ritual was repeated by the other high priest, his eldest son. Thereupon the blessed bread was passed round among the reclining guests. Apart from the flesh of the swine, which their religion forbids, nothing was lacking. There was Egyptian fish, fish from the Sea of Galilee, fish from the city of Akko, prepared in a variety of styles, baked into pastry or pickled, and in the latter case the peculiar Jewish weakness for garlic and onion was abundantly evident. Every course was followed by wine. It was extraordinary how these Jews knew exactly what wine to serve with each dish. Thus, after a course of oily fish, they served a drink distilled from white grape seeds, which refreshed the palate with its keen tang and sharp body. The meat dishes were of countless variety, but mostly fowl. There was dove, chicken, and duck, also wild fowl, like pheasant, but in no instance was the bird served up intact and as though still alive, in the manner much loved by us Romans, and brought to a high pitch of perfection by the Alexandrian cooks, who specialize also in the serving of whole sucking pigs. After every dish the servitors passed round the golden ewers with rose water. In addition to fish and meat, there were plentiful supplies of greens, boiled and in royal salads. Among the greens were some unknown to our Roman tables, plants and spices which cleanse the palate and assist the digestion.